some yellow cards, a couple issue to both clubs. But other than that, a back and forth championship final so far as we are just one minute into this second half of this championship final. If it stays at nil-nil, or even if both teams score 1-1, as Croatia has a chance in the box now. But Paul back in, shot, scores! Oscar Cordon! This game is over from Warrior Field in Waterloo, Ontario, the home of the University of Waterloo Warriors. The final whistle has been blown, and Toronto, Croatia are your 2015 Canadian Soccer League First Division champions. Turned over though, another chance. Whiteman the delivery, and it's a cracking strike from the Vaughn striker, and he equalizes here in the 39th minute. The leading scorer, Jarek Whiteman, adds to his tally, and that's number 18, and equalizes this match. It's one all. Amato. Up. Can Whiteman counter? He can. Whiteman, he wins the ball. He's on a breakaway here. The strike! Into the corner it goes, and the Azzurri's leading scorer gets the equalizer once again. And it's all tied up 2-2 two to two in the 57th minute. Jarek Whiteman with number 19 on the season and his second of the match. The Chiara now with the delivery. Back post. The header back in. The Azzurri with a chance. It's a box and in the back of it. And it's number three for Jarek Whiteman. The hat trick converted. 3-2 in the 60th minute. You're watching and listening to Mamma Mia. This is Fire Talk Footy Edition with Nicholas Fiore. Welcome everybody to episode number 36, Footy Edition number two of Mamma Mia. This is Fire Talk. I'm Nicholas Fiore, your host. And on this edition of the show, I am pleased to be joined by Kwame Aua, for Forge FC player in the Canadian Premier League, CPL. As you can see behind me, since he's came to the CPL, he's won back-to-back -back chips with the dip, as you can see right there, as Drake would say. But Kwame, I appreciate you coming on, man. Ah, uh, man, it's, it's been a, it's a pleasure coming on the show and uh, can't wait to get started. Absolutely. And obviously, you know, you've had you've had maybe not such a long journey yet. I mean, you're still young. I mean, we're the same age, 95 borns, uh, mm -hmm. you know, born in December for yourself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it hasn't been too, too long yet because you're still pretty young. But, mm -hmm. you know, it has been a few teams um, until you've gotten to to forge and essentially back mm -hmm. home. Talk about, you know, your journey so far. I'm going to touch upon, you know, the teams a little bit. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, starting youth, Armour Heights, Club Uruguay, mm -hmm. Woodbridge, um, and then obviously Sigma. Sigma, I feel mm -hmm. like maybe was your big, uh, like your kind of your breakout. Okay, you know, instead of a mm -hmm. club now, going to an academy. Um, mm -hmm. A cool story we're going to touch upon with Coach Bobby, of course, mm -hmm. with Sigma, and obviously now with Forge. And I heard he, and I saw you just shaved his beard, so that's pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, nah, nah, it's a lot. It's April it's a Fool's lot. joke. Uh -oh. Remember, it's April Fool's today. Remember? April Fool's, that's right. Yeah. Um, obviously, we're recording uh, mm -hmm. We're recording a little bit earlier, and then this will be posted a little bit later. But mm -hmm. April Fool's, guys, if you don't know already. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, then Connecticut, obviously, Yukon Huskies. Um, then Sigma, New York City, Forge. Talk about you know your your journey so far and how much adversity you have to have gone through in order to now be with Forge. Oh man, I mean you've named all the teams I have played for, and it's crazy how the journey like started. It started in the obviously the Driftwood Spanish League El Popular, and I was playing there uh, until I was probably fourteen, I would say. Um. Yeah, and then I ch I changed from Armour Heights to Uruguay within the Spanish league, and Uruguay was more exposure. I mean, better football, uh, better coaching, and I I've always just been the person that like I always wanted to take the next step, the next level, play with better players, better myself. I was never a guy that was the best on my team, and I always liked it like that. There was always um a a viewpoint like a a max point to reach. So there was always some, someone I had to catch up to or something to catch up to. And I think that was an important part for my development. Um, going to Woodbridge, uh, it was a great experience. I got to win the Ontario Indoor Cup. 
Uh, I went to Ontario Club semifinals. You know, you know those famous tournaments, the Robbie tournament, all those oh, tournaments yeah. are growing up. Yeah, I uh, got to play in those those great experiences. And then finally, I just made this switch to Sigma. And that was partly because of the guys that I grew up with on, I grew up playing with on uh, Uruguay, which was like Christian Samaniego, uh, Richie Larea, Kyle Lahren. We all grew up playing together on Uruguay. We had a Uruguay, Club Uruguay versus Brampton Battle Cats battles with Kyle Lahren and Chris Danko and those guys and Markel and Justin Sauter. So we all ended up going to Sigma and reunited there. And it, from there, we, we just all took off. And then going from there, I was able to get a full scholarship to University of Connecticut. Did well in my three and a half years there and then got drafted to New York City FC, which was the beginning of my pro journey. It's funny, Kwame, because I'm telling you, both us the same age. I mean, I'm in November, you're in December. Mm -hmm. I could almost guarantee we probably played against each other mm -hmm. uh, down last because I played youth rep my, yeah. my whole life, too. I played in Spanish League one year. Yeah. I played for Brampton East, Aurora, yeah. Etobicoke. So we probably played against each other. Mm -hmm. um, I know my, my good friend, Sebastian Huro, he was on the Battle Cats. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're very, we're very tight. We're best friends to this day. Yeah. We played high school football together as well. So, um, and he played uh, against you as well. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just crazy how, how the soccer world can work and, you know, look at yourself now and, and a Jonathan Osorio and a Cavallini and a Richie Larea, Chris Nanko. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, sometimes you may have different paths, but mm -hmm. eventually you might even be playing on the same together. team uh, together or even against each other within the mm -hmm. same league. So that's uh, that's pretty cool, of course. Um, with with UConn, you, you mentioned you know full scholarship, of course. Um, was, there, was there any other options when it was uh, time, you know, to maybe pick your NCAA uh, journey, or was UConn like the best fit for you? Sixty four games played, you popped in eight goals as well. Midfielder, left back, you're pretty versatile too. But was UConn mm. the place? Um, honestly. Going in to my before my twelfth grade, yeah, before twelfth grade, I didn't have that many options. I had like, I had coaches like probably from University of Buffalo message me, University of Vermont. I wanted to visit to uh, University of Vermont, and then I had like Temple University. It wasn't that big of a, that many big uh, schools, um, and it's a it's honestly a testament to Sigma and like the ninety five age group. What we were able to do, we opened the gateways for some of these younger kids to go to these big time schools because of the performance that we put in into the showcases in North Carolina and showcases at the Potomac tournament and the Sigma showcases. Like we put in those, that those performances in the showcases in the States and it gra grabbed the attention of a couple like the Syracuse's, the Yukon's, the Boston colleges, like Kyle Becker went to Boston college, the Oregon States, like yeah. at those times, those are the schools that we were looking up to. And then UConn just happened to be the year before it, uh, top two in the country. And how I got there was literally, I was so close. I was like this close to committing to Vermont, but I, I bet on myself. I didn't want to sign the Good. national letter just right away before the Sigma showcase. I wanted to give myself one more opportunity. And if I couldn't get anything better, then I was going to obviously settle with Vermont, which doesn't, which, in the back end, it doesn't sound good, but for my personal ambition, it was like, okay, let's see if I can do better, right? Well, so, you always, uh, well, you always want to push yourself, right, Kwame? Yeah. And, and 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 see if you can take your, you know, your talents, sort of say, you know, to like a next level and challenge yourself. Because really, mm -hmm. sometimes when you don't challenge yourself, it's a possibility that you might not even become better. Is that even a thing? Mm -hmm. That is that is another thing too. So I didn't want to. Go, I wanted to go somewhere where like. Like I said before, I wasn't the best player and somewhere where like that they still wanted me and I'll be an integral part of the team. So when UConn came to the door, I was like, it was definitely a yes because they were top two. I think they were second in the country in attendance and uh, like top five in ranking. And then Kyle was, was going to UConn as well, Kyle Laird. So it was like, it was an easy pick for me. So I ended up going there and had a great three and a three and a half years, four seasons. So. I enjoyed it as much as possible, and I and I performed clearly good enough for Patrick Vieira to draft me to his team. Exactly, like, and we're 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 gonna touch upon that. I mean, the the name in itself, Patrick Vieira, is like wow. Is it's one of the biggest names in football. Let's be honest. But from 2013 to 2016, you were with uh, with UConn, and then 
2014, 2016, you know, you came back, you came back to Ontario, came back to Mississauga, you played with Sigma, uh, the youth academy that you were with, then played League One Ontario, six caps there with a goal. Uh, then 2017, 2018, drafted uh, in the MLS with New York City FC, 10 games played. Uh, and then you moved to Forge back in Hamilton, back in the, mm -hmm. the greater Toronto area. Um, mm -hmm. 35 games already, one goal, two championships back to back. Um, just wanted to throw the stats out there. Talk about, you know, New York City. Obviously, you know, after UConn, coming back to League One Ontario, which is technically, I guess you can classify semi professional um, mm -hmm. in, in, in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Were you a little bit, you know, not upset, of course, because, you know, Sigma is still Sigma, one of the top uh, academies in Ontario, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But um, were you a bit like, okay, I just came from UConn, now I'm going back to League One, or were you like, okay, let's, let's, let's settle in here, let's see what can happen, because then you were in the MLS Century Draft, or the Super Draft, and then the honor of being drafted by Patrick Vieira in New York City. Mm -hmm. FC, talk about that. Yeah, so how it worked was like during the summer, I would come back and play League One Ontario during the summer break, and then I'd go back. So the most important thing was just to maximize the amount of games I played each year. So then I would always come back into preseason with UConn in August. I'd already be game fit, so it was never playing catch up. I was always ready, ready to go, so I can be firing from day one. So I never looked at Sigma and League One Ontario, and plus. When League One Ontario first started, it was 2013. It was after my first season at college. Yeah. I had a lot. I had we had, I had a lot going on. After my first season at college, I got called into the U20 national team camp. And then from there, I went back to League One Ontario. So like I was like already in a groove. And like to build off of that, League One Ontario was there's so many guys from that first one, two, three years of League One Ontario that are now in professional ranks, whether in Europe, whether in MLS. CPL, whatever. So you can see the competition was there and it was only it was always gonna it was always gonna be good enough for me to go back to school and step up my game even more. So it just kept me fit, it kept me um in a professional environment and it helped me uh going to the next level. I mean, playing the maximum amount of games. It was one year that I played consistently from um August all the way from August 2014 to December wow. 2015. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. See, no, so a year and a half straight, I had I was playing games. Yeah. And that's what's that was really important. That was that was my best year in college. Best and, season in college. And see, that's that's huge for you because you know you, you just it just touches on the ball, right? Every yeah. every single time, every single training every single game right i mean i know mm -hmm. like you it touches on the ball every time you can get touches on the ball it's it, it's important right at any mm -hmm. level um and obviously that propelled you and helped you in getting drafted uh mm -hmm. in 2017 mls super draft 16th overall by new york city fc first of all how honored and humbled were you to be drafted in the mls but also from a legend the french legend in patrick Vieira. man it was uh too good to be true like I, I was shocked obviously like because obviously it's tough as a as a young kid you're hearing rumbles of like oh like some analysts saying that you're not good enough you're gonna go here you're gonna go there the mock draft it's hard for you not to look at that stuff but honestly for me I was like I just gotta believe in my talent and know that what I put out on the field and I'm playing the right way like it's gonna attract the proper team so when I when I got drafted by NYCFC, I, I'm like, I knew this was a team that I I could fit in automatically. Um, there was guys there that um, accepted me from this from the start, and it was a grind. I mean, that was that's probably one of the only MLS teams that doesn't have a second team, and to go against the likes of like Pirlo, David Villa, and these guys every day it was it was a blessing, and it was not a curse, but it was it was challenging. But I'm never gonna take I never took it for granted, so. It was, it was important that like I got obtained everything I was able to obtain the knowledge from Patrick before he left to Nice uh, halfway through my second season there and just continue learning, keep pushing. And then after that, it's just about games, just getting game time, getting meaningful games, meaning, meaningful touches, right? You were coached obviously by Patrick Vieira for, for a little bit there. And, and you mentioned, you know, David Villa, Andrea Pirlo, you know, playing with those guys. Did you did you ever like wonder like what 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 the heck am I doing here or no like you know this is this is where I belong I'm gonna work my tail off and 
and to play with these guys, were you a bit starstruck as well? Or like, I can't, I can't believe I'm here. Let's, let's get to work now. Oh, no, nah, most definitely. I was starstruck when I, I think the first starstruck part was when I first met Patrick in the hotel in LA before wow. the super draft. Um, I, I, me and Chris Neckel took a picture with him. This is before I had any, any collection that I was going to go get drafted by NYCFC. And then when I finally got drafted, I met my boy, who's like one of my close friends who plays for Leeds United now, Jack Harrison. Like as soon as I got drafted, he met me backstage. We chopped it up a little bit. And then I, I received a text from David Villa. So that was another. Wow. I was like, damn, this guy. I was like, damn, he got my number right away. <laughs> yeah. And then another starstruck moment was when I finally got into preseason and I met Andrea Pirlo. And I was like, yo, this guy's one of the coolest guys. Like no ego, no it's just calm, did his thing. And like, you're on the field. And even though they're in their latter parts of their career, you can see why these guys are legends for Italy, for Spain, for France, for like, you know what I mean? Juve, like all the teams that big teams that they've played on. So you just try to learn as much as you can from them. And then try to make sure that like, you're here for a reason now. So you got to You can't just be in awe all the time. Yeah. They do amazing things, but you got to find a way to be part of that, that amazing team. Absolutely. And, and a way, you know, that you could be a part of, you know, a team like that with all those players is obviously your versatility, Kwame. Um, midfield, left back, winger. I mean, maybe you could even do more. Uh, yeah. But how, how important is it not to just maybe, this is obviously great, you know, pr- perfect or, or seclude yourself to one spot and, mm. and excel in there thoroughly. But maybe for a guy, you know, looking to obviously get more playing time and find the right team and, and and connect um it's important to be so versatile and play not one two but even three or more positions on the pitch yeah i mean it's definitely a double-edged sword like it depends on how you look at it like some people will be like you want to be a, a jack of all trades or a master you want to be a master of one or a, or a jack of all trades so it's like it kind it kind of depends like i think being versatile goes a lot towards how much you understand the game so you could tell how much a person can excel in a position or different positions and how much they excel tactically if they're able to play different positions because not every position is the same right and i think that's just a testament to how um important uh patrick bobby and like my yukon coaches like how important they put the emphasis on like understanding the game, understanding how to play the game properly, where to go, when to go, how to play the ball, like certain stuff like that. So it is a double-edged sword because sometimes you're like, man, if I just worked on this one position for my whole life, I would have been probably the best in, in Canada. But because I switched, I've had to switch from here, 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 it's, it's difficult. But I would, I will say for certain, for certain positions, it's good because you can make your career last longer. Guys like Philip Lamb went from a right back to a center mid, extended his career by two, three years. Yeah. Marcelo went from a winger to a left back, extended his career. Like, you know what I mean? Jordi Elba, a lot of guys move down because your legs just don't have it anymore. And there's younger guys that are in your position. Some guys change from a center midfielder to a center back, Mascherano. So, you know what I mean? There's a lot of instances where because of their understanding of the game, you get to play a lot longer. So you know how that goes. So you play a lot longer, you make more money for your family and you enjoy football for a longer period of time. Hey man, I, I, I know how that goes. I mean, I was, mm. I started, I started in my youth un, under eight actually with uh, the guy, you know, my friend, Sebastian Hurrah. We started mm. under eight in Bolton, under eight to under 11. And we were both, you know, I was a striker. And then mm. all of a sudden under 14, I decided under 13, I decided, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go in net. And then I just yeah. switched the goalie and I yeah. ended up playing uh, with Aurora and Pro Stars um, mm-hmm. in League One, Ontario. I just stopped two or three years ago mm-hmm. as a goal, as a goalkeeper, right? So um, as Jim Brennan was my coach, obviously the York Nine, York United, I should say, FC coach now. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's, I think, important, right? If you want to maybe get the playing time or get, or get more opportunities to maybe try mm-hmm. one or two more positions, obviously, mm-hmm. if, if, if God willing, of course, and mm-hmm. if, you can, if you can get it done. Mm-hmm. But, um, and obviously you did. Uh, Kwame, I want to touch upon the, the, the academy difference. Obviously you were younger, of course, but, you know, yeah. switching from, you know, Armour Heights, you know, an academy in youth, um, 
you know, Club Uruguay, Spanish League, mm-hmm. and then Woolbridge, and then going to Sigma, a few clubs there, then the academy route, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, now parents in youth days, you know, they, they always seem to try to go to the academy route, but then sometimes the academy route might not be the best. You know, it's just, it's just really secluded to personal opinions at this rate. Mm-hmm. Did you see any difference from football in youth in Ontario to the academy route in Ontario? Um, I say like for parents, when you're deciding to, whether to put your, your kid into an academy or not, now Canada has a better scouting system where it's like, wherever you pl- you're playing, if you're a good player, you're going to be able to get noticed. It's not, it, that wasn't the case back in the day. Like we were youth t- team football loaded, right? A lot of guys didn't have money to pay, pay for academy soccer. So that's what I look at it too. And it's like, wherever your kid is going to enjoy himself the most and flourish the most, right? It's not about – parents need to understand that it's not about them. That, that, that's, the, that's the most important thing. It's not about you. It's not – and it's not about winning. It's like, what am I What am I going to – I'm putting my money into this, so what is the end result that I'm going to get, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you play to win, but at the end of the day, you're, you're playing to further your career as long as possible, right? So the difference for me was that – uh, youth soccer, it was like a lot of, there wasn't a, as much of a commitment to it. Like when I was at Woodbridge, like you can be like, oh, I'm not going to practice today. Like you, you didn't have to like go, at Sigma, there was already a professional environment. Like at, as a teenager, like you had to send emails, you had to do this, like you had to weigh in, body fat, all that stuff. And youth soccer is like, oh, I'm paying to play anyway. So I don't care how I show up. I'm just going to show up. So, like, I think that was, I mean, a lot of youth teams are changing and they're kind of changing into the academy mode, but mold, but it's, that's, that was one of the biggest differences that I've seen. But a lot of the players that ended up going to TFC Academy or Sigma, um, we're from Uruguay or Brampton Battle Cats or um, Vaughn or or stuff like that. So, Vaughn is a club team that is like an academy, you know what I mean? Like, they play like an academy league and stuff like that, so everybody's kind of going that route because it kind of starts the professional um, landscape, professional environment for the kids at a younger age. So therefore with Sigma, you know, you saying it being a little bit more of a professional environment, even at the young Mm -hmm. age in Mm -hmm. 2013, when you moved on from Sigma to UConn, do you think Sigma in itself, you know, developed you and helped you move on and and for you to be prepared uh, to play for UConn in NCAA? Oh yeah, because in my mind, in my mind, like I give Sigma a lot of credit, but obviously I give myself credit too because I knew what I was getting into. I was a 17 year old going into play against 22, 23 year olds, guys that are 21, 22, like guys already had almost at their physical peak, right? So it's like, what can I do to make myself stand out, but not have to be bullied on the field, not have to get into crazy tackles? Not a, like I was physic. Luckily, I was athletic enough and physically prepared enough but at the same time it's still an adjustment and because the way I was able to tactically and technically better myself at Sigma I was always a step ahead of some guys that have been playing college soccer for two three years already so I got to I came into UConn and I walked into a starting position and never looked back how was your uh, so therefore I mean it must have been pretty good but mm-hmm. how was your overall college experience in your opinion oh it was amazing on and off the field amazing <laughs> Different, different different atmosphere in the states, isn't it, Kwame? Yeah, a hundred percent. Especially at a school like UConn, like we're a good bat. We're a really top tier basketball school. If you can see that women's basketball team that are in the final four again, thirteen yeah. seasons straight. Yeah. Um, when I when I was there, uh, my first year, my the men's basketball team won the championship, and the women's basketball team won the basketball championship, and then the women's basketball team won the championship three times again in a row. So it was four years straight that they won. So I mean, I had a great time. Yeah. Sports I had a great school, time. Right? Sports school. Yeah, sports school. Right. That's for sure. Uh, and obviously with, with, with that being like that and, and having the success, not just in one sport, but in several sports, do you mm. think UConn in itself or even college and the NCAA route um, is a good foundation for going pro? Maybe not in Europe right away, but maybe mm. at least the MLS route at first? Yeah, I mean, there, right now it's kind of diverging a little bit, but I definitely think as a youth, if you're not going to get signed to the first team right away from when you're 16, 17, I definitely think 
going somewhere where you can get games, getting into a professional environment, somewhere that's going to get you exposure, getting, and at the same time, you can get your education as well, right? You can be, you learn to become, that's the difference. You learn to become a man when you move away from home and you are by yourself and you have to fend for yourself. Like some of the youth guys, yeah, they sign a pro contract, but you're still living at home. You just have to go to practice. So it's like the same thing that's, that's going on, but you have mommy and daddy there. I see that I tell them it's like either find a team that's outside of your comfort zone or outside of your zone, or you go to go away to school and actually try to live by yourself with people that are around your age and deal with real life problems. There's times where you can't find food and you just have to figure it out. So this, it's just about maturing. It's about discipline. It's about working hard. And just like, there's going to be a lot of times where you're going to be like, damn, I'm going to hang up the boots here, <laughs> but it's how, how much you're motivated to succeed. Absolutely. Uh, moving on to, you know, Forge and, and current times, Kwame. Um, signed with Forge FC, January 29th, 2019. Uh, reunited with, you know, the former Sigma coach, Bobby, right? Bobby uh, Simronatis uh, from Sigma, obviously now with um, Forge FC. Did you feel like, even though you're still young, and, and I'm sure, you know, the future is bright and you have plans maybe to go to Europe and 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 uh, so on and so forth, of course. But did you feel like at this moment in time, um, it was time to come kind of back home and 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 come to Hamilton, come to play with Forge and your former Sigma boss? I mean, I knew the whole uh, Canadian Premier League was developing and stuff like that. Like I had other options as well. Um, it was just going into a situation where I knew I was going to play the most amount of games as possible. And I've been lucky to do that. I've been available for every game. I think I, I've missed probably like two games out of coach's decision, but I was always available and never been suspended. So it's like, all right, uh, after this, like, obviously I still have ambitions. I want to get back into the national team fold. I want to get back into uh, like the next level. I always want to level up. Um, but yeah, I think it was a good decision because I could be I could have gone somewhere where one mistake or one slip slip up, I, I'll never play. And I'm already going from a situation where I wasn't playing as much. I can't I couldn't afford to go somewhere else where I wasn't going to play. So I think this is the best situation. And we were able to win two championships and go on two CONCAF league runs. And I was able to play extremely well in those games that were very important, right? So I think that was important, just being able to when the big game, when the big games came to step up and show my true quality. Call me. I, I, don't, I don't think you regret it, bro. Like two championships, man. <laughs> two, two, two championships, 2019, 2020, back to back, winning your first one. Okay. Your first season, second one, as you can see behind me, like the celebration is real. doesn't matter really what age, what level, what sport, what league, a championship is a championship, but how, how awesome of a time was that for you guys? And for you personally, uh, you know, back back to back uh, championships with Forge and the CPL. Honestly, like yeah, last year was a long year, and we weren't even sure if we were ever even gonna get any games done if we were gonna have the league last year because of the whole COVID situation. And it's it was it was a tough situation. And granted, like um, a lot of people lost their lives, a lot of people were uh, negatively affected by it. And for these guys to put something together at last minute and for it to run so smoothly is a testament to the people running the league and the guys in the back just doing whatever needed to be done to get this done and testament to the players for following rules for being vig uh, di what is it diligent sorry um, and just making sure they're focused on the task at hand and not and doing not doing anything to um, jeopardize what they can what we could possibly have so it was a it was it was a great time pi wasn't too bad even though we were locked up in the hotels like field to hotel field to hotel the games are coming quick and coming fast but this might surprise you this second championship it it doesn't hit as as much as the first one <laughs> i mean there's a lot of adversity this second year but i always knew coming in because of the preparation that we did as a team even through COVID, like the runs and everything that we put ourselves through, like through Zoom calls and the running and all that, the tracking, like, I'm like, there's no way we're going to lose this tournament. I went in thinking like we're winning this tournament. It was never a doubt. 
But the first year after how we started was like, and all the trials and tribulations, people hyping Cal, uh, Calvary because they beat Vancouver Whitecaps. When we are the one that won against Olympia, who's a lot better than Vancouver Whitecaps. But hey, that's teach his own. And the story is about Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. And for us to shut them out three games straight and win the championship on their home field, that hit a lot better. The cel- and the celebrations were a lot better because there was no COVID. Celebrations were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and obviously, you've seen, you seen uh, around uh, North America and in Canada, of course. Mm-hmm. But no, I mean, I, I could I could see where you're coming from, Marie. I mean, first year, more adversity, even though you'd think the COVID year is more adversary, but it was ended up being more of a tournament, you know? Mm-hmm. It was like an extended uh, Ontario Cup. <laughs> yeah, type of thing, right. So I understand exactly, um, mm-hmm. Tommy, where you're coming from. Of course, mm-hmm. let's talk about um, a few few more to touch upon here. But the full circle, Kwame, with with Coach Bobby, uh, you know, coaching basically in your youth, you were young, right? You're just a kid, you know, growing mm-hmm. up, uh, developing. He's with an academy at just a local mm-hmm. academy in Mississauga, Ontario. I mean, you're from Toronto, Ontario, uh, and just, just there. And then all of a sudden, you sign he's the first forge coach and you're back with the guy who I guess you could even, you could attest to maybe helped you in a way, get to where you are um, today. That's pretty, a, a, a pretty much a full circle football mm-hmm. moment. If I don't say so mm-hmm. myself, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it definitely, it definitely is full circle or oval, however you want to <laughs> put it. Yeah. Cause like I, I left, to go to school but I was always back and forth it's not like I was totally detached from Sigma yes in the off season with New York I would come back and train with Sigma that's the safe fit so I was always attached in some way shape or form but 100% like for a lot of us he's part of the reason why we are players the way we are today and he treated us like how he would treat anyone he was straightforward and at a young age for for someone to to just be straight up with a kid and not baby them is like he knew that where we came from, like we came from the trenches. Like I grew up in Jane and Finch. So it's like a whole different ball game. It's like, I'd rather someone be straight up and honest with me. And then like, Hey, let me get grinding. And then like, Oh no, nah, don't worry. So he was brutally honest because he seen the potential that we had in our, in our, in our group. And going into college, I think our whole starting 11 had full scholarships. So that's a whole Testament to him. And Richie went to Akron, Chris went to Syracuse, me and Kyle went to Yukon, just to name a few. And then, so like those are big schools that were big schools at the time. So, I mean, coming full circle, you, I knew what I was getting into. It wasn't going to be anything that I was that I was going to be blindsided by. I knew that if I did what I needed to do, like, and he was one guy that like he told us this at a long time ago. Like, things weren't going to be handed to us. So I knew as as long as I did my work and I played to the best of my abilities, I was always going to be playing and I was going to enjoy it because there's a lot of guys that I played with on Sigma that were coming to Forge. Do you remember uh, August 16th, 2020 versus, versus Edmonton? How was your celebration oh, yeah. when you scored your first goal, buddy? <laughs> was, it, was it a crazy Man. one or was it a humble celebration? <laughs> it was a, it was a, I took a knee with the fist up because Absolutely. of that summer. That summer, that was when the whole George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter movement was happening. And okay. us as a team, we made it known from the beginning, from the first game that we were going to take a knee. Yes. during every national anthem and then every team started following suit so it was important that like me it was myself and chris that we talked to becker our captain about it we're like yo we're gonna do this like if you guys want to follow you can if you don't like i totally understand but we did it and the whole league start, start, started following suit and we even had a couple meetings with a couple captains and leaders about the whole video that we did linking arms around the field during the ottawa calvary game and it was important to just get the message out there. I mean, I'm always an advocate for Black Lives and for any um, bio, biopic um, lives. You know what I mean? Anyone that is experiencing any type of hatred or any type of racism, I'm always there to fight for it. Even like recently, the whole Asian rate, uh, Asian hate and the mass shooting. So I think it's important to get the message out there. A lot of people just skip over that stuff because we were, we were becoming too numb to it because it happens so often. And that celebration after, and you know, it's crazy. That was my first professional goal. A lot of people are shocked by it. A lot of people are like, wait, hold on. Like, this is your first goal ever? I'm like, yeah. They're like, you've been playing soccer for so long. And they think because like 
I always have opportunities or maybe because I'm talked about, like I'm filling up the stat sheet, but like, that's not my, that's not my game. My game is just assist. Yeah. Like, but when I score, I do score good goals. So I had to celebrate like that. And it was, I, I enjoyed it. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you scored eight goals with UConn one uh, with six games there with Sigma, but only 10 games, uh, 10 caps with, uh, New York City, and then obviously your mm-hmm. first goal was was with Ford. So I knew that was your first mm-hmm. goal, and and I knew and I knew Kwame. To be honest with you, that's what you did for the celebration. But I wanted, you know, mm-hmm. I wanted the true, um, how I want to put it, the true emotion of of your mm-hmm. of your response of your answer because mm-hmm. I agree with you one hundred percent. I mean, Black Lives Matter, of course, and 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 really mm-hmm. they all do, and the mm-hmm. equality in 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 USA, but you know, in Canada too, it's it's not hundred percent. That's what, and that, that's one thing that I was trying to let people know that like. Yeah, this I was all in happen. It's only being exposed in US because there's a lot more people and because it's happening at a more significant rate. But I don't want people to think that this is not happening either yeah. in Canada, especially yeah. with the native people as well. And, and exactly. And and it's here too, right? I mean, it's all over the world. USA, yes, it's in a broader spectrum. I mean, they're uh I don't I don't touch upon politics at all, but their former leader wasn't uh mm-hmm. the best. Yeah. It wasn't too ideal. Um yeah as well and, and maybe leading some charter but that's besides the point um mm-hmm. but i'm glad you did that i'm glad you responded like that because we need more of that you see the nba you see the big you know the big big uh five major sports leagues do it but you know the canadian premier league as you can see you know coming up uh getting yeah. better more more uh uh versatility more um nations being represented mm-hmm. of different backgrounds as well so that's very mm-hmm. important i'm glad you you brought that up uh i just want to touch upon canada a little bit obviously mm-hmm. You've had your uh, you've had your Canada experience being mm-hmm. called up, um, you know, twenty threes, um, mm-hmm. seventeen for a couple of friendlies, and mm-hmm. you want to get to that. You want to get there. You see, uh, you know, Lucas Cavallini, and you see your friend Kyle Laren. You see your friend Richie Larea. I'm sure you know John mm-hmm. Florio well. And mm-hmm. You know that entire roster, <laughs> pretty mm-hmm. pretty good, right? And mm-hmm. you know, and I know you can get there. I know you can get there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've seen you and I've watched you. I mean, we're the same age, right? So mm-hmm. I know we know a little bit about you and we have, it looks like maybe mm-hmm. some mutual people that we even uh, are in contact with. But what do you, uh, how is it always, you know, representing your country? I know you did it once with a few friendlies, but mm-hmm. is it is it that feeling where like, okay, if I'm not always there, I need to be always there. And and if I am always there, I need to continue to to work my tail off in order to keep on representing my country. Yeah, and that's exactly how it was. I mean, granted, the way I got called up was from the U23s. I was playing, and then, I mean, I was at New York, and then they called me up to the U23s, and we played against Kazakhstan, and we played against Qatar. And those two games that I played, I got – I played out of position the first half against Kazakhstan. I played right back. Wow. And I – yeah, a lefty lefty playing right back, it was like the first time I've ever done it, and I did really well. There you go. The second, the se- and I, I got an assist. The second game, I got another assist against Qatar. And Octavio Zambrano was like, yo, gonna, he's like, you did so well. I'm going to call you up to the next national men's team camp. And I ended up getting called to the camp in um, Montreal. And it was a great experience. It was like, I never thought, because I've been snubbed a couple of times, like the U20s or U23s or whatever, U17s growing up is like, I never thought that I have the opportunity to actually represent Canada and just being able to go there and be like, for in this coach's opinion, these are the best players that Canada has to offer. Then it was like, I'm doing something, I'm doing something well, but for right now, Canada has a really, really good team uh, where I'm at right now. Ability wise, I definitely think I can play within that group of, of players. Not necessarily saying I'm the start, but I definitely think I can play a next group of players, but it's just about, um getting myself to the next level because a lot of guys are playing higher leagues than me so they're more exposed to better players better environments and that's that's just how the teams in the national pool should be chosen like you're choosing the players that are playing on the best teams and are consistently playing the best competition so for me to get back there like which i want to get back there i have to make another jump either overseas europe and and continuously prove uh prove myself to, that I deserve to be there but I do get a couple messages here and there from guys that say like yo you deserve to be here but until I do what I need to do to get to the next level then I'm, I, 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 I won't be there anytime soon but hopefully sooner than later 
hey man, just work work, work to that uh, 2026 World Cup when Canada is a a United man. Post. <laughs> man, I'll be, I'll be 30 years old. That's you can mm. still do it. Come on now. <laughs> no. mm. Yeah, man. I, I, we'll no, see. No, we'll I know. see. I know absolutely. And and you, but but for people who don't know Kwame, like it's it's not just a club team, right? It's a country. You gotta you gotta work your your rear end off to get on to get on a team for a country. And and when you're in that pool, okay, your name is floated around and there's opportunities. But how hard truly is it to crack a national team roster in football in soccer? Wow, I mean. Canada right now, like it's it's really really difficult, and it, obviously they go by position. But there's probably like six, seven, eight players per position in the pool. So you have 23 guys you call in, and you probably have a pool of 50, 60 players. Oh, yeah. And depending on where you are in the pool, like in that position, then you probably will never get called up. And at least if I have never to, am to get called up, which I don't think is gonna happen. At least I could say I represented my country twice. Yeah. So it's like, at the end of the day, like a, a lot of guys get called in and don't get called back or don't get to play friendlies, just this and that. But I've been able to do it. And so I know the feeling so, and I know what it takes to get there. So I think I just need to keep pushing and hopefully I can get back there. But yeah, right now Canada is going through a golden generation and we need to take advantage of it. So I'm not going to be selfish and be like, oh yeah, I, I'm going to be there if I'm not better than the next guy. You know what I mean? I still want Canada to do. I still want to see my guys that I know on the team succeed. So, but I'm definitely going to, I definitely want to be part of the, the success. Absolutely. And I know, and I know you, you know, you have buddies on that team, right? As we, as we mentioned, yeah. And I know you want them to only, uh, only do good, but you know, you've lost a couple of years with Forge though, call me. You've been on some uh, pretty big stages in the CONCACAF league. If people don't know what that is, uh, uh, continental club tournament, football tournament, um, you know, confederations north uh central america caribbean uh continent but you've been playing teams from guatemala honduras panama city Haiti, el salvador in big games to try to qualify for the Concacaf champions league um how cool was it to play in these different countries against these different teams i mean man i never thought in my life i'd be going to the three most dangerous countries in the world <laughs> in two years I never thought I'd ever go to El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, ever, ever. And that experience was unbelievable. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Had a great time. Honduras was amazing. I've been there twice now, uh, 2019 and 2020. And just traveling through the pandemic, the way our team manager, Jelani Smith, handled it, the way he was able to organize everything, and the way guys on our team have been able to just focus and, like, understand that it's tough for everyone uh we were be, we were able to be with our families we'd fly back from one place can't train for a week and then fly back another place so that we can start training to prepare for a next game but it was amazing panama city amazing 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 experience uh taro was an, a really good team and definitely it just sucked that we didn't have fans but honestly it's still amazing regardless to play in those national team stadiums so and these are experiences that I want to experience with Canada as well. Absolutely. And finally, Kwame, you know, the CPL season, the Canadian Premier League are trying to anticipate a Victoria Day long weekend, May 22nd start date, obviously, given the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, how, how prepared is the team getting? Unfortunately, we can't really have full team training, but how ready uh, is it, you know, could the team be in, and how anticipated are you guys to hopefully have a CPL season this summer? Um, no, nah, the season's definitely going to happen. Uh, it's going to be a proper season. 28 games, playoffs, Canadian Championship, uh, CONCACAF League. It's, it's definitely all going to happen. It's just a matter of when we can get fans in the stadium. And I think that's really important to the CPL for revenue purposes and to keep the CPL running in general because of how much money they lost last year because there was no fans. How many teams, how many teams lost money last year because there was no fans? So I think... The mo they're most what they're trying to hit is making sure that like people can get vaccinated and have a certain amount of capacity at least in the stadium, and for us to enjoy the games. But it's definitely going to be a normal start. It's going to be a normal season, uh, probably a little condensed if it ends up starting a little later. But same old. Absolutely. Um, listen, Kwame, I appreciate you uh 
coming on, coming on the podcast, coming on the show. Um, great episode. And I know a lot of people are going to enjoy it. Um, best of luck for yourself uh, moving forward for Jeff C. And obviously, hopefully with the uh, men's national team for Canada and maybe uh, overseas one day um, in the near future as well. But I do appreciate you coming on, buddy. Thank you for having me. It was great to talk to you. Absolutely. Uh, and who knows, maybe we even saw saw each other down the line back in back in our youth days, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty crazy uh, full circle stuff. So I do appreciate yeah. you coming on. Um, listen, everybody, that was Kwame Aua, Forge FC, CPL, midfielder, left back, number six in the Canadian Premier League. This was episode number 36, footy edition, number two of Mamma Mia. This is Fire Talk. You can watch on YouTube, listen on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, follow on all social media platforms, as well as new merchandise. Mamma Mia, this is Fire Talk. It's released, baby. I'm Nicholas Fiore. Kwame, thank you once again. Stay safe out there, folks. And Mamma Mia. Lopez. Lopez turns it over. And now Cavallini with it. Cavallini finds Baker. Albanese comes out. Baker gets to it first. Around the keeper and in the back of the net. Blows the whistle. The captain, Dylan Carrero, for Woodbridge. The penalty kick. Steps up and takes it neatly so with a great, brilliant penalty kick strike into the corner. The ref blows the whistle. Whiteman steps forward, looking, and right down the middle with the strike there and the penalty kick in the 19th minute. Anything coming, now a chance for Jason Mills. He comes in, the shot on goal. Off the woodwork again, the rebound comes out. The Mills again, shot scores! Oh my word, number 11 with the finish, and that's Brandon Mills. Oakville looking to play long instead of building up. It's going to favor them off the second ball. A chance for the Blue Devils. Can they get anything on goal? Goes back outside looking for the offside call. It's not. Now cross back in. Back door. It's a goal. And the Blue Devils are on the door first. Push back with good defensive play from North Mississauga. And they steal it. And now look at the counter. Can the Panthers go? It's 4v4. Good pace. Botello plays on the far side. They stay on side. North Miss an opportunity. They come on the break with a shot. In the back of the net it goes. And North Miss have one back. Continues with a North Mississauga free kick in midfield. An opportunity here. Shot comes in in the back of the net. It goes. Oh my word. What a strike. Now back kicked up in the air. One with the header. Place down. McNamara has the opportunity. And in the back of the net. It goes. Corner kick now for Oakville. It's a dangerous one. And in the back of the net again. And it's McNamara. That was Mamma Mia. This is Fire Talk Footy Edition with Nicholas Fiore. Thank you for watching and listening and stay tuned for the next episode.